Another slow start ultimately dooms the Tar Heels, but this time it was the second half. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Thursday, March 28th, 2024, although it's Good Friday already on the East Coast. Welcome into what will be, unfortunately, the final live postcast of this college basketball season for the Tar Heels, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I am your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining me at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. I want to thank you so much for making us your fo- first postcast l- watch or listen. Special shout out to all you everydayers out there. You hate to say it, hoping for a celebration and Elite Eight uh, opportunity, but unfortunately, we're gathering together for what will be a therapy session. Weird that uh, we were looking at the possibility of both a Carolina reunion with uh, Caleb Love, and neither team gets there. It's unfortunate, uh, but it is what happens. Alabama beats North Carolina 89 to 87. For those of you tuning in, here's how we do these live postcasts. I'm going to give you four things for observations from this game in the immediate aftermath, an ad read, four more observations, and then I'm going to check out, uh, see what we got going on in the chat. So we're going to start there. And I apologize. It looks like my camera is (laughs) doing weird things for those of you watching. All right. Number one thing we got to get to. And as we start talking, I'm actually going to go ahead and bring up the box score right now for us so we can all see that uh, for those watching on YouTube. First thing, I talked earlier in the week about the slow starts that North Carolina had and how they could not do that against Alabama because that Alabama offense would absolutely put North Carolina in a hole they could not rebound from. And for the Tar Heels, They did a fantastic job of that in the first half. They were down uh, and then went on this kill shot, 10-0 run to get up, had a 10-point lead. Alabama methodically worked back, but North Carolina ultimately wound up with an eight-point halftime lead. And at that point, you're feeling good because R.J. Davis hasn't really done much. Carolina's got scoring from unexpected sources, and you're like, all right, so do the same thing in the second half and then just put the pedal to the metal and go race out this thing. Unfortunately, the problem was North Carolina had a terrible start offensively to the second half. As I just said, the heels led by eight at halftime. They did not get a field goal until the 15-18 mark of the second half when Armando eventually had a putback. That was the first time Carolina scored a non-free throw point in the second half. And it was just like one, maybe two free throws even before that. So Alabama goes on this 13 to three run to take a 59 57 lead. And that halftime deficit is erased. In fact, in the first 10 minutes of the second half, Carolina scored exactly seven points. You just can't do that against this Alabama offense. You know, their, their defense, Um, has been much maligned. The second half is probably some combination of Alabama rising to the occasion some, so you got to tip your hat to that. And Carolina just looking completely out of sorts. Uh, The whole second half, it felt like they never found a rhythm. Uh, Very, very odd indeed. So ultimately, for Carolina, instead of extending their eight-point lead, just allowed Alabama to get right back in it. And then it was back and forth the whole second half until ultimately the Crimson Tide win 89-7. to Second in our um, live postcast here, unfortunately, R.J. Davis picks the worst time to have perhaps his worst shooting game of the entire season. I haven't gone, obviously I haven't had time yet to go back and compare it to all his other games this season. But he finishes 4 of 20 from the field, 0 of 9 from 3. The free throw line was the saving grace. RJ did great there. 8 of 9. The only one he missed was that 1 and 1 just before halftime when Mark Sears like plowed over him. Um, And so really good stuff at the free throw line. But man, y'all, RJ just could not buy a bucket. And we haven't seen that from him all year long. You know, maybe there's one or two games where he struggled, but he'd eventually find one. Guess what? This was the first and only time all season that R.J. Davis did not make a three. 
in the Sweet 16. I just, that's sports, man. It sucks, but that is sports. If RJ Davis had a remotely normal game in this basketball game, Carolina wins by eight to 10 points. That's sports. It stinks, but that's the way it goes. I didn't like, I'm so proud of him, you know, continued to attack. Great, great tenacity getting to the rim, getting to the free throw line, forcing Alabama to either foul or let him score since the shots weren't falling. And he did a great job distributing seven assists, just one turnover. I mean, you can't fault him for these things. He He's the ACC player of the year. He's got to keep shooting, but it just didn't happen. And then, of course, the question we're all going to ask, and, and I'm not even going to begin to try to answer it here, but is this the last time we'll ever see R.J. Davis in a North Carolina Tar Heels uniform? And I feel myself getting choked up even asking that question because of what this young man has meant to this university. Uh, number three. North Carolina, after that Grant Nelson run where where um, Alabama went up by five, Carolina came out of that timeout and went off, ultimately took a lead. I forget how big the lead got up to, three, maybe it was, maybe five. Again, we're so close in the immediate aftermath, I don't have it. But here's the problem. One bad decision can doom you, and that's what happened. Now, let me say, hear this. You don't want to be in the position where one wrong decision ends your season, right? Like Carolina shouldn't have put themselves there. They, they, there were missed opportunities all over the place. Like, but, but it is what it is. So Carolina, there's about a minute left on the clock, had just stormed back to take a lead. I think Mark Sears hit a layup on the other end to cut the lead back to one. Carolina is up 85 to 84. RJ um, gets a screen set. They both go with him. He passes off to Jalen Withers at the top of the key. There's still half the shot clock left. There's 15 seconds on the shot clock, about a minute on the game clock. What do you want to do in that situation? You either want to get the ball back to RJ because he's been making play after play down the stretch. You want to give an entry post to Armando, see if he can do something in the paint. Maybe get it to Cormac, who's been on fire from three. Maybe get it to Harrison Ingram. But no. Jalen Weathers, probably the fifth option, not probably, the fifth option offensively on the floor, finds himself wide open for three, and he is baited into taking it. It's the wrong person shooting the wrong shot at the wrong time. Like, I get it. If the shot clock's at one, bro, you got to pull right there. But at the very least, run 15 more seconds off. The, like, I'd rather you just stand there and not shoot it and let the sh get a shot clock violation and at least get the game clock down to 45 instead of shooting it there. And unfortunately, that decision might have doomed the Tar Heels. Because Grant Nelson goes down, gets another and one, completes it. Now Bama's up to and... That's that. And then I will we'll unpack on Friday's full show what happened after that. But this is why I say it all the time. Every single possession is of the utmost importance, particularly now when everything is so magnified. That, that play, that choice, that decision, unfortunately for Jay Witt, is going to be dissected over and over and over again all season long. And so... Um, because in some respects, you want to say, oh, that's all right, buddy. You'll learn from it and move on. But now the season's over, and there's guys that are never putting on that uniform again. That's the weight of one bad decision. Number four in our recap of this game. As you look at the second half minutes, some really odd substitution patterns, some really odd minutes played. If you haven't gone back to look at the second half minutes played. Cormac, Ryan, R.J. Davis, Harrison Ingram, each iron fived it, although it was an iron three. They all three played 20 minutes of the second half, the entire second half. Armando played 16. I think that was ultimately, he picked up that third foul, goes to the bench, wisely so from Hubert Davis, but that, that was it. Elliot Cadeau only played five minutes of the second half, and I think, in fact, for the game in totality, 
played, I'm looking at it right now, just 13 minutes. So we only played eight minutes of the first half, five in the second. And then for the bench, again, in the second half, Paxson Wojcik played the fifth most minutes of the entire team in the second half. He played nine. Great. I was so happy for Woj, by the way, to hit that three. The first three Carolina hit in the second half. We'll get to the three-point shooting in just a second. But Seth only played four minutes. Jalen Washington only played two. And Jalen Withers only played five. Now, I'm sure you, I obviously I'm recording this probably as Coach Davis is doing his press conference. So I have, I don't know yet, but I'm sure he'll be asked about those substitution patterns. Why is Seth not out there more? Why was Elliot not out there more? What what is it about these guys that you don't have them in the game in this moment? Doesn't add up to me. I thought they would like at the very least, Seth or Elliot makes a better decision at the end there, as we were just talking about, right? Easily, easily. So very, very confusing, and we'll have to look into that. All right. Now we've got. Four more observations to make, and then I want to go to the comment section where the comments are absolutely piling up right now. So I'm curious to hear what everyone has to say. By the way, there are an approximate crap ton of you tuning in in real time right now at 12.43 a.m. Eastern on the East Coast. Thank you for being with me. I'm so glad you're here as we have a therapy session together. All right, we're going to get to the other things we need to talk about coming up in just a second. But before we do that, I need to tell you that this live postcast edition of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, say goodbye to busted brackets like all of ours because the Tar Heels are out because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. So go check it all out today. There's great lines right there on FanDuel. So visit it, fanduel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Isaac Shade here with you in the immediate aftermath of Carolina's 89-87 loss in the Sweet 16 to Alabama, unfortunately. And the fifth observation we want to make coming out of this thing, I tweeted it, or at least put it in my notes at halftime. I can't remember now because it all runs together. But the first half three-point shooting, I said, was that fool's gold? And is Carolina going to be able to either sustain it or find a different way? And we already talked about how kind of putrid the Carolina offense was for a vast majority of the the second half, particularly the first 10 minutes of it where they scored, as we said, just seven points. Carolina was otherworldly in the first half from three, 10 of 16. I, I tweeted this out as well. In the entire season, the most they had made in a game, not just a half, was 12. And they made 10 in the first half. So that alone was great and impressive and way to go. And, and it was coming from sources you didn't expect. I was so proud of Elliot taking shots early, confidently, but then his confidence waned. But he made two in the first half. Seth Trimble made two in the first half. Cormac was going off. This dude must love playing against Alabama in the NCAA tournament because he had a game for them against Notre Dame earlier in his career. And I kind of thought like, oh, that's what's about to happen here. Cormac is going to have a game against Alabama yet again and put them in the ground but it wasn't, wasn't enough. So Carolina goes 10 of 16 in the first half, and it turned out that it truly was fool's gold. 10 of 16 in the first half, second half, just two of 16. I already mentioned the one that Paxson Wojcik made, and then Cormac made one more in the second half. That was it. That was all. No one else made a three. RJ was 0 of 6. Harrison was 0 of 3. Elliott was 0 of 2. And Jalen Withers was 0 of 1, as we just talked about in the second half. So uh, that that is not going to do it. And and I think a lot of us probably felt that, like, hey, that's nice, but you got to find something different in the second half. You got to get the ball inside to Armando, like I talked about. Like, that needed to be a focal point for the Tar Heels. And it was at times, but it wasn't enough. Carolina needed to go to it more, and we'll talk about that soon. Um but I mean, you see it even in the dichotomy of they took exactly 16 threes in both halves, made 10 of them in the first, but just two in the second. That's not their game. And I thought they got baited into a three-point shooting contest with Alabama. 
And it's unfortunate because Alabama didn't go off in this game from D. I mean, they made a bunch, but it was not like otherworldly. 11 of 26. I mean, that's 42.3%, but it's not like they were on absolute fire. So they ultimately wound up making uh, one three fewer than Carolina did. And so if you were to tell me Carolina is going to make more threes in this game than Alabama, I would have thought they would have won. But the problem is they took way too many of them. I've said it multiple times this year. There's been a couple times where Carolina took 30 or more threes and it's never their recipe. Carolina got taken out of their game. Kudos to Alabama for baiting them into it. Not enough veteran savvy from Carolina to get the shots they needed. Mm, that's a bummer. Uh, by the way, how weird is it to say that five different Tar Heels made a three and none of them were named RJ Davis? Wow. Number six, Armando Baycott is done as a Tar Heel. Appropriately finishes his career with a double double to tie Tim Duncan for the most double doubles in ACC history, second most in NCAA history. 19 points, 12 rebounds. Seven of those rebounds were of the offensive variety. Just really good stuff from Armando. Unfortunately, he picked up those three quick fouls in the early part of the second half. I thought if he had been able to stay on the floor, maybe that is a difference maker. I know he came back in pretty quickly, and I don't think he ever picked up that fourth foul. Um, but, man, it just – yeah, what a career. I'll just say that. What a career from Armando Baycott. We'll obviously take more time in, in the days and weeks to come to honor Armando – in what he has given to this place and his time in Chapel Hill. But for now, um, let me just say this. Armando Baycott, thank you. And I'm sorry it had to end this way. Ah, that sucks. Again, I find myself um, emotional. Maybe maybe you're feeling some of that too, or maybe... It's we're all too shell shocked right now, and we'll feel that emotion in the days to come. All right, number seven, going back to Armando Baycott. Yes, Armando took 18 shots in this game, and yes, he missed 10 of them, so it was under 50% from the game. But even still, North Carolina needed to play through him more often in this game. It was clear that. As Coach Nate Oates had said, Alabama wanted to do everything they could to stop Armando. And I thought part of that was realizing they didn't have much to be able to do it. So they were going to bait Carolina's not as good three-point shooters into taking them. And they did. Instead of, as I said, getting the shots that North Carolina wanted. It, if you go into Armando, where, by the way, down the stretch of this game, Nick Pringle probably shouldn't have been playing. You saw how hobbled he was. But what what do you do? I, like, I, I hate it for him. I hate that he's hurt. But if you're an opponent, you have to abuse that and you have to go to work against it. And North Carolina either didn't identify it or even worse, identified it and was unwilling or incapable to go after him. I thought as soon as Nick Pringle came back in that game hobbled, you go into Armando Baycott Every single possession. If they bring help to Armando, he kicks out. Somebody takes a three or you just keep swinging the ball and get a better shot. If they don't double him, let him just own Nick Pringle, a hobbled Nick Pringle in, in the post. And I just thought the Tar Heels did not do that. At least explore it more. Let Armando have the opportunity in what turned out to be his final game as a Tar Heel, make plays for his team. Along a similar lines, and this is my eighth point, Armando Baycott picked up his third foul early in the first half, goes to the bench. Grant Nelson picks up his first or his third foul also early in the second half, never went to the bench. And same thing as Nick Pringle. I thought if, if I'm RJ Davis, if I'm North Carolina, I am attacking him every possession, getting into his body, forcing him to make a play. Because with three fouls early in the second half, he's either going to have to play Ole Matador defense or maybe pick up that fourth foul. Sure, he's going to block a couple shots as he did because he's big. But I, I, I just, 
North Carolina, I thought, did not go at him enough, and I needed and wanted to see that more. All right. That's a bummer. North Carolina's out, and I, I really thought that they had what it took to be moving on. Unfortunately, didn't make the plays in the second half. Made enough of them in the first half and just didn't do it in the final 20 minutes. And that's what stings. And um, consequently, I've already said, it's definitely the end of the road for Armando Baycott, who is now out of eligibility. Also for two of the transfers for Cormac Ryan. His college basketball career is done. Cormac, thank you for trusting Hubert Davis and the University of North Carolina to come play your last year in Chapel Hill. I hope you're glad for that decision. And I feel like you are. Paxson Wojcik, thank you for choosing to come to North Carolina for your last year of college. We're grateful. I, I know it's probably not how you thought or hoped this year would go in terms of playing time and production. But your presence on this team was critically important. Thank you. And again, we'll, we'll see with others, you know. Will RJ decide to come back and use his COVID eligibility? Harrison, we're going to have to talk about all of that more later. But right now, what we want to do is go to the comment section, with I, which I think believe, which I believe right now, I should say, has the most comments I've ever seen in one of our live postcasts this year. And um, unfortunately, uh, that happens because we're all in this therapy session together. Um, and, and that's what it is. So don't want to take a ton because I know we're getting close to one o'clock Eastern time. Very sad. There are a lot of people agreeing me. It looks like with, with the second half substitution patterns um, and all that, uh, just just tat, just bad stuff. A lot of people talking about the, the Withers shot as we did earlier. Um, so great stuff. Just a lot of comments. Um, look, this, this is one that's ultimately going to be a thing for next year. But Famous Quays asks, when are we going to start recruiting bigs that can shoot? Well, we have Jalen Washington is one of those. Um, but Armando Baycott, as we know, is a holdover from the Roy Williams era. And that's just not what Roy was necessarily always recruiting. Um, I will just say there are some guys in the transfer portal that Carolina could go after if they choose to do so that are made of that variety. But right now, looking ahead to next year, outside of James Aconquo, there is no thick Tar Heel in the Armando Baycott mold. So Carolina needs to get someone like that uh, to, to fill in for that because I just don't think James Oconquo is going to get those minutes. Um, yeah, so you really, really hate to see it. Um, Emily Von Pocky asks, did RJ have some sort of injury going into the game? Not that I'm aware of. Or was he impacted by getting his elbow slammed after that tough foul, which I think was that uh, Mark Sears foul we were talking about in the first half? Well, uh, I mean, at that point, he had already played a full half on it because there was like three seconds left before halftime. Also, if I remember correctly, it was his left arm, his non-shooting arm. And so, I mean, yes, there is an effect on that, but but not critically so. It's just, you know how usually when R.J. Davis shoots it, it's like that is going in. And if it doesn't, it feels like a surprise. I felt that way when he was at the free throw line on Thursday night. But RJ's shot tonight, like even out of his hand, like just the trajectory of it was like, oh, that's not going in. Like you just felt it because you know how it looks when it looks good for RJ. Um, and it just didn't didn't make sense. Derek Thiessen, what's up, Derek, asks, why didn't we see Trimble or Elliott much, especially Elliott? The offense flows better with him. Derek, I'm right with you. I would have liked to have seen more minutes from both of these guys. As I said, uh, I think five minutes from Elliott in the second half and just four from Seth. Um, particularly as, as the offense was not flowing well at that point, I'm going to at least try inserting Elliott back in just just to give it a look. If it doesn't work well, it can't get any worse than it already looks all out of sorts. And so I, I would just like to have seen it. Or same thing with Tre Seth, who's been doing better initiating offense lately um, to let RJ play off the ball or 
um, whatever that may have been. And so, yeah, um, Derek, it, it is a little confused. I don't know, you know, specifically with Elliot, if it's just like, Hey, we're going with experience here, but I, I really didn't like the combinations because it was, what didn't make sense to me is it was different than what we ever see down the stretch of a basketball game. It was, um, the, the four starters minus Elliot, and then either chiefly Jalen Withers or Paxson Wojcik in the game. And usually down the stretch, if it's not Elliot, who is it? It's Seth. I would have liked to have seen more than that. Um, a lot of questions about RJ coming back. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. Somebody says in here, I don't want RJ back. Uh, no. What? Why on earth would you ever say that? I got no, 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 no. Come on. Uh, <laughs> so, um, man, that is very unfortunate. So uh, let's see about maybe one more question in here um, or observation. I know there's a lot, but um, uh, Bryce Soda, man, says it this way. This is perhaps a good kind of wrap up for us here at the end. Love the season that this basketball team provided. Unfortunate for the big guys that they couldn't get one last title, but they did put in a heck of an effort. Let's not forget the Duke sweep. And look, I love this because even on a night like tonight where we're disappointed and sad, I know there's going to be plenty of time to look back and be grateful and thankful. But it is important to already go ahead and just say, man, what a ride these guys took us on this season. Think back to last season and everything that happened. I know losing at this point is disappointing. I had said that an Elite Eight run was what I thought would be a successful NCAA tournament. So by that measure, Carolina didn't get there. But man, what a season. I'm so grateful for it. And Bryce, I'm so thankful for your words there, even though uh, it's disappointing where Carolina got. So uh, I know there's lots of more comments, probably some other good questions, but I've got two more shows to record tonight, Locked on College Basketball and Friday's Locked on Tar Heels. So we're going to have to get out of here. I apologize for that. Plus, you all crazy folks need to go get some sleep. Again, thank you so much for tuning in even late into the night. That really means a lot that you would come hang out with me. Thank you for that. For now, I want to remind you to still come join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community where we can commiserate together. The link to that is in the show notes. It's free to join. We'd love to have you. If you haven't subscribed, please do so both on audio and on YouTube. I do not go away. This is a daily podcast, even all off season. So we're going to be talking all about transfer portal stuff, uh, draft decisions, all of that. So make sure you stay locked in because I'll have all of that for you as it comes. Football spring practice is coming. All of that. Stay locked in. But for tonight, I want to say it even after a loss because it always has to be true. Say it with me. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. All right. We'll talk again on Friday or technically later today. <laughs> but until then, peace.